Um, so, so, so this talk will be an experiment, a very artificial experiment, because I'm going to try to to give a talk and shock you by having a talk with a, without a single formula and without a single word actually on the slide. So this, these are the last words you will see on these slides. Um, so having you know having three papers, one of which is about uh, Max Weber and about you know the impact of Protestantism on on economic growth. The second paper being on the impact of universities on economic growth in the Middle Ages, and the third paper being about the impact of this gentleman, which you might recognize as Napoleon Bonaparte, um, on, on economic growth in the 19th century in Europe. So, so what do you do in, um, in that case? Uh, what, what kind of title do you give to, to your dissertation? And you know, I started off when, when I started thinking about my dissertation as essays economics, and that, you know, at some point I realized um, you know, I couldn't avoid the stigma of going to the market and marketing, labeling myself as an economic historian. So I said, you know, essays in economic history, essays in European economic history to be precise. And then I was very grateful that one of my advisors actually suggested the title that you saw, namely Natural Experiments in Economic History. And, and what I'm going to talk about today is going to be, you know, talking a little bit about natural experiments, talking a little bit about economic history, talking a little bit about how the two fit together, and, and talking about, about uh, the papers of my dissertation, which I guess are the ones you're interested in. Um, so what's in common on, uh, in these papers? So, so one is, um, these are papers about economic history, as you've seen. The second thing is that, you know, the way I see economic history is that it has to have two tasks. One is answering good questions in history, answering questions that we're interested in because of a historical perspective, like, you know, uh, what was the impact of Protestantism? What was the impact of Napoleon? Was Napoleon good or bad? This is, you know, a, a very imminent question, imminent to, to the local history of that point. You know, we're not claiming that there's any external validity in that sense. The other thing that they have, and, you know, that's the second thing which I think, you know, distinguishes good, good research in economic history is that it also answers questions about economics. So we have questions about, you know, what's the importance of cultural factors in economic growth, and that's, you know, why uh, we might be interested in a paper on uh, Protestantism. What's the impact of good institutions on economic growth? What's the impact of educational institutions, like, you know, the legal uh, schools of the Middle Ages on economic growth? So that's, that, that, that's the second thing that is sort of in common to this paper, which I try to stress, which is that they combine both e economic questions and historical questions. And, and, and the last thing that they have in common is sort of, you know, this focus on, um, you know, sort of, of thinking about, about the source of, of variation that you have in the data. And, and do your, your, your economic analysis, your statistical analysis, by thinking carefully what prompts the source of variation and trying to cope with this question of, you know, not all sources of variation are, are, are genuine in the same way. And that's, that's a way I want to talk about natural experiments in this context. You know, I don't want to contribute to the inflation of this term natural experiments. You know, I looked up some statistics and, uh, you know, I think in the 20 years from 2000, from 85 to 2005, it was cited 200 times in the title of a paper. And in the years from 2005 to now, it was cited over, over a thousand times doing a Lexis Nexus search. So, you know, I don't want to contribute to this inflation of the term, but what I really want to focus you on is, is the fact that we, we know whenever we do an empirical exercise, we have to think carefully about, you know, what's the source of variation we're looking at. And especially in, you know, in the context of history where you cannot do, you know, randomized control experiments, uh, you know, you really have to be smart and, and try to come up with, with some interesting ways of, you know, constructing uh, meaningful counterfactuals. And, and in a sense, you know, I, I think is, uh, you know, this is sort of, of, of the reflection of, of what happened in econometrics in the last 20 years. So you might remember that in um, 1984, I think, Ed Lehmer had a famous paper that was called Let, Let's Take the Con Out of Econometrics. And he was saying, you know, a feeling that I think many economic theorists still say today, econometrics is sort of arbitrary. You know, you can say, show anything, you can construct a regression, you know, whatever you want. And, and he was saying, well, you know, the only way that, that we can, you know, get econometrics out of its long-term irrelevance, because you can show anything with econometrics, is being more focused on robustness analysis. And, and what happened in the, you know, 20 years after Ed Lehmer wrote his paper is actually that, you know, econometrics didn't become totally irrelevant. Actually, you know, if you look at, you know, there's some statistics in the Journal of Economic Literature on how many papers, say, in the AER have some econometrics, and how many papers that used to be only theory now also have a little part with econometrics, like, you know, Giacomo's paper before, uh, this, 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 is, uh, this is actually very much increasing over time. And, and one of the explanations that was given to this is that really we, we found a way of making econometrics more credible and, you know, there's been some debate and, you know, 
some of you might, might know what I'm referring to, you know, this debate recently in the Journal of Economic Literature, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives this summer about, about you know, structural methods versus, versus reduced form methods. But, you know, there is this view that, that, you know, someone called the credibility revolution in econometrics that happened in the last 20 years, which, you know, might be a little bit of a grandiose term. But, but, but I think it's, it's, it's well described by, by this quote, which I'm going to read to you, is that, and I'm citing Guido Imbens uh, talking about this, what is shared by this literature is not so much a lack of theoretical or economic motivation, but rather an explicit emphasis on credibly estimating causal effects, a recognition of the heterogeneity in these effects, uh, clarity in the identifying assumption, and a concern about the indigeneity of choices and the role of study design plays. So I, I Guido Imbens, we refer to this as the causal or design-based literature. So, you know, that, that's what I, um, what, what, what I, in a sense, want to refer to when I talk about natural experiments. Not, you know, not, not a cheap way of, of, of you know, putting a, a smart label to, to some work, but actually trying to, you know, pointing out that there is some thought, I, you know, I try to convince you that there is some thought about, you know, really, is it meaningful what we're doing with the data in this context right now? So let me um, um, finish by, by, by thinking about you know, how did this literature, this, you know, forgive me the term which some of you might hate, this credibility revolution in, in, in economics, which, you know, sort of, you know, started with labor economics and then pervaded development and public economics and is going down to other fields. Um, how, how did it enter economic history? And when I, when I started thinking about this, I realized that the first paper, you know, of course we can, we can debate about this. But the first paper I can think of that, that sort of brings in a little bit of this flavor into economic history was, was the 2001 paper by Bassam Mogli Johnson Robinson on the colonial origins of, of, of development. And if you think about it, no one talks about this paper as an economic history paper. It, it, it grew out of the 1990s literature on cross-country regressions and, and the delusion that we had with cross-country regression that really could prove basically anything, as, as Shabir Salim Magatib nicely showed. Um, and, and, and so maybe really the feeling is that, you know, there are many papers uh, in this field and, and many of them, maybe, you know, you're not going to think about them as economic history because they're not labeled as economic history. And, and you know, these papers all use, you know, all the standard toolkit of, of you know, the fields that I was talking about before, of labor, of development, of, uh, of public economics. And, you know, these could be papers that use, um, you know, carefully chosen this and this, like the paper that I'm referring to cryptically with this slide, the paper by Jeremy Aditmar on the impact of the printing press. So he's got the nice paper uh, doing a diff and this basically on the impact of the printing press on the growth of cities. Or it could be papers with a clever and well-argumented IV. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, you always have to be careful about IV and Angus Deaton is very furious about this. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, at the paper by uh, Bruce Sacerdote and Jim Fearer about the impact of colonialism where they use the direction of wind as an instrument uh, as to uh, what kind of uh, island was conquered by which colonial power. So, you know, you can argue there, but, you know, the interesting thing about good IVs is that you can talk about them and actually discuss them. Or, you know, regression discontinuities, which I'm sort of critically referring to by these border stones. Uh, so there is a good paper, for instance, let me think, the, um, a paper by Elise Willery uh, at Paris School of Economics on the impact of uh, borders in French Africa on uh, today's outcomes in, in, in African states, or the paper by Melissa Dell at MIT uh, looking at the long-term term impact of um, exploitative institutions, exploitative institutions in the colonial areas of Peru. This is the mine of Potosi, and the mine of Potosi actually captured people from around, uh, the indigenous people there, and forced them to, lay, to work in this mine. And what she finds doing this regression discontinuity analysis is that these coercive uh, labor institutions actually have an effect on consumption and income until today. So, you know, let me, let me conclude by saying, you know, it's, it's sort of odd and interesting, I think, that all these papers are not identified as economic history. And, you know, maybe you could see that as a late triumph of this cleometric revolution that, you know, in the end they were so able to bring back in economic history into the mainstream of economics that you don't recognize it anymore as economics. But, you know, let me, let me just claim that, you know, my view is that economic history is a lot to gain and little to lose from moving closer to the methods of, 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 of economic inquiry that we use in, in, in the standard field of economics. And, and you know, there's really little to, to lose and, and much to gain. And, and, you know, let me also conclude with, with the hope that I've sort of whetted your appetite for, for a little more of, of economic history.